right, everyone, welcome to my very first ever podcast. This is super exciting. Um, so this is uh, Mr. Nun here, or as all my friends call me, just plain old Nun. Or the beard. And or I'm, the beard. I'm Mr. Chitwood. Um, we're hoping that t- through today's podcast, we're going to, one, show you guys that, hey, we're still alive, one, mm-hmm. and we two, um, we're thinking about you guys, and we yep. are also thinking about history, and we're thinking about the current climate of the the world right now and what we're going through and um hopefully through this podcast we can not only see um more of who we are as individuals who we are as a society but also think a little bit more about the um the content that we love that is history Mm -hmm. so absolutely so it has been one of my things for a very long time i've wanted to do kind of a joint lecture with with Chitwood, I think he's one of the coolest teachers on campus, one of the most groundbreaking. Um, and I thought it would be a lot of fun to kind of do something that is kind of not really cross-curricular, but cross cross history. Yeah. So you do a lot of US history and I do a lot of GovEcon, so. Yeah, and we're, we're actually kind of at a, a nice crossroads right now for both of our classes, um, naturally with the school closure we have both kind of had to be a little bit flexible in terms of where we're at and what what kind of what's the subject that we're kind of thinking about in terms of gov econ or um in my case world history and history of the americas but something that we both found were at a uh pass Mm -hmm. and kind of had something mutual in both subjects was that we're about to start talking about slavery and the civil war Mm -hmm. be it in gov econ u.s history or history of the americas that's generally where we're at in our pacing guides that's where we kind of wanted to touch on today but we also want to talk about other things right we had things like um what we're doing to keep ourselves busy with the school shutdown yeah let's go ahead and Um, start with that what are we doing to keep ourselves busy i know that i have four kids at home and so we are doing lots of online learning um so we are still doing kind of homeschooling at home Mm -hmm. Um, I've been able to go out and do PE with my kids. That's yeah, been what my wife tasked mm-hmm. me with doing. So I've gone out and done bike rides with the kids. I've done yesterday. Joseph and I played football for a while. It was kind of running? fun. <laughs> Please. You've seen me before. <laughs> I do not run. Yeah. So, I mean, sa- same here, um, except not you've four been, kids. You've been going out with, with your four kids. <laughs> um, I got a couple dogs that we've been taking on more exercises we've been going on walks and um exploring the trails around our house since we're still kind of getting new to the area Mm -hmm. and understanding um what is around us but i mean i've hit the gym more in the last three days than i have in the last three months yes because it's in my garage (laughs) um so i mean that's been nice is kind of waking up and going to the gym and and actually taking care of myself a little bit more than Mm -hmm. i had been um Another thing that I haven't done for a while is me and my wife are actually in the process of doing a thousand piece puzzle, uh, which I think is a thing with most families throughout Mm -hmm. the United States right now. It's like the school shutdown happens and then we do a puzzle for the first time ever. Um, So, I mean, it, it, it's been a fun process to go through with her and it also is the puzzle is on a a uh, small coastal town in Italy on Cinque Terre. Oh, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's giving me like this kind of withdrawals from my Italy trip and wanting yeah. to go back there, even though um, the status of Italy with the whole well, COVID-19 <laughs> thing is not that great, but it's giving me flashbacks to where we... Um, when it was great. When it was great, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, you know what we need to do? We need to make Italy great we again. We do need to make Italy great again. So, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, it, the, you know, the whole thing that we can do with that is social distancing and, uh, yeah. you know, following the kind of directive to try to help everybody out, you know, not just ourselves. Yeah, you know, if we can prevent people from getting new cases of this crap, it'll eventually go away and mm-hmm. we can get back to life as usual. I know that I was looking forward to some some baseball and Mm -hmm. for the first time ever i bought season tickets to the a's this year Mm -hmm. and i was so excited to go and watch and now uh i don't get to go watch yeah we'll just have to put it on hold yeah i mean uh sometimes there are the things that take precedence sometimes there's more things that are important Mm -hmm. our health our safety our family our friends making sure that all that um 
is going on, and then we can figure out all the other stuff later on. Well, speaking of social distancing, should we even be in the same room doing this kind of thing? We need six feet apart, right? <laughs> yeah, um, six feet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I think the best we can do is just uh, be um, in solidarity with one another, trying to do what is asked of us by our local agencies, mm-hmm. state agencies, federal government, all that kind of stuff. But also just common sense, you know, yep. wash your hands, yep. practice good general hygiene, all that kind of stuff. It's best practices in this situation and in future situations when we don't have to worry about this pandemic that's going on. Absolutely true. Yeah, just focus on being your best person. Mm-hmm. Be the best you you can be. The fact that I'm walking through Target and I don't see any soap on the shelves anymore is unsettling because it makes me think, well, as, what have you been doing? What, what have you been doing with your hands? Have you not been washing your hands? And I don't even want to know what that means about the toilet paper. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so maybe um, everyone has bidets and you just didn't know it. No, that's true. Maybe you're behind. Like, I mean, on, maybe behind maybe. on the bidet train. Okay, gotcha. All wow, right, we're, that's we're getting disgusting. Yeah, maybe Absolutely we should move gross. on. You're a bad person. So, um, what we want to talk about in terms of the content today was talking about the Civil War, since that was a, a shared kind of theme where we're at in both classes. Well, Granted, kind of, kind of a shared interest as well. And a I shared know, interest. I know that mm-hmm. when I was growing up, it was the Civil War that caught my caught my attention. It's mm-hmm. what made me love history. And uh, when I was going through um, my undergraduate degree at UCSC, um, I studied primarily the history of the the Americas in Africa, and one of the most interesting classes that I ever took was a class by Kate Jones on the Civil War, Mm -hmm. Um, and it was something that really kind of piqued my interest again in in historical research through one of the last kind of tail ends of my undergraduate career there before I started becoming a teacher. Yeah. It was one of the last things that I really put a lot of heart and soul into in terms of undergraduate research, so I got a couple things that I wanted to share about that. Yeah, and what's really interesting about the Civil War is it really just had lasting impacts on the United States. I mean, you can look at the United States still today and see mm-hmm. some of the some of the results of the Civil War, see um, kind of where we've been and why we feel the way we feel about certain things exactly so So, it's definitely very even though it was 150 60 almost 160 years ago now well 1861 to 1865 would be about 135 years i'm terrible at math too you guys all know that Uh, 135 years to 2000 so you add an extra 20 20, that's 155 yeah it's been a while about 150 years though so Um, well, let's start at the top then, huh? Yeah, let's start right let's at start the top. Let's start with 1860s election, so give yeah, us a little so, context there. So if you think America is divided mm. now, you should have definitely been around in the 1850s. <sighs> the 1850s, you have a lot of um, states' rights versus federal government rights. Mm-hmm. So you have states still trying to figure out what their powers were yep. in the Constitution. When we get to the doorstep of the, of the Civil War, we're only about... 60 years out from the constitution being ratified yep so the constitution is still a very new document we're still a very new government we're still trying to figure out who we are as a country and those of you that uh have been in my history of the americas class you know we just wrapped up our uh unit on nation building in the americas so you guys know that we're still in a pretty fragile state following the ratification of the constitution with internal improvements uh, spreading across throughout the United States and also Manifest Destiny, trying to figure out what define what borders define the nation, but also what mantra define the nation. Um, and when it's coming down to this identity crisis, we're going to see that really pop up in two specific regions. Mm-hmm. That is the North and the South. Mm-hmm. So in the North, you have a... Um, a really industrialized economy. You have a uh, society that is more populous um, in yeah, terms of absolutely. dense pop, uh, uh, I guess, populations in these urban city centers compared to more of a rural mm-hmm. um, society in the south. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's going to be two main differences that really pop up within these two regions based off of their regional identity well but also i mean you have even more um (coughs) going on than just that 
in the lead up to the 1860 election, you have Lincoln, who's mm -hmm. a Republican and is vocally anti-slavery, mm -hmm. is, is opposed to slavery, says he will do what he can to abolish slavery. And before we move forward, we should identify that the idea of party lines in terms of Democrat, Republican is different back then. Right, you had the Republicans, you had Democratic Republicans. You had Democratic. You still had the Whig Party. You still the had Whig the Whig Party, party was then. around. Yeah, Lincoln won his first. No, one? Did he win? I think I he think lost so. his first election as we'll, a Whig. We'll figure. I'm out pretty sure he lost. Um, I think the first election he actually won was to the presidency. So. He lost a lot, which is impressive. We'll so that, that well, what that proves is you can be a loser and still be considered the greatest ever. That I think everyone true. thinks the pres that President Lincoln was one of our best mm -hmm. and like said, he uh, lost I, more than he won i think there's a good hashtag bo that both of us really embody that is hashtag fail until you don't right fail until you mm -hmm. don't absolutely right so yeah uh, as it seems uh president lincoln's his first um election into office his first success was um in 1846 into um that is when he became a u.s House u.s representative, representative yep mm -hmm. um, from illinois mm -hmm. so i mean back in back in those days illinois is not actually the big powerhouse you think it is that would now have been, um in 1834 is when he was Whew, first that was a long time ago yeah but that's illinois house of representatives mm -hmm. that's so, not u.s house but first elected office was correct you got to start somewhere so but back then, I mean, Illinois was not this big, strong powerhouse that you think of it now. So prior to 1854, Lincoln was a member of the Whig Party. Then mm. uh, from 1854 to 1864, he was a member of the Republican Party. And interestingly enough, I didn't know this was a thing. Between 1864 and 1865, there was this thing called the National Union Political Party. Really? Um, yeah, interesting. We'll have to do some more so, in, more more research on what that is. Uh, fun have, educational historical fact. Yeah, I that have, doesn't matter. Does not matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Anyways, in this 1860 mm -hmm. election, it's really kind of a, a bizarre election. You have Abraham Lincoln as a Republican, but then you have Stephen Douglas as a Democrat, mm -hmm. who's also from Illinois, and then you have John Breckinridge from the South also a democrat so you have two democrats and one republican running for president interesting that sounds very similar to the current climate that we're in now uh, yeah, bizarre <laughs> right but the reason that there were two democrats running for president is stephen douglas refused to say that he would keep slavery mm. he was a somewhat op opposed to slavery while in the South, they definitely wanted to keep slavery. So um, in the South, they nominated Breckinridge to run for president. And so you have this, this splitting of the Democratic votes in the 1860 election, which makes it easier for Lincoln to carry all of the North and not need to carry any of the South. And let's remember that, um, you know, this is politics as it is still today, right? These mm -hmm. three members... Uh, that are uh, trying to vie for office are trying to do what they can to win the election. They Absolutely. naturally have their own political opinions. They have their own ideologies and, and goals for the country and where they want to take it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, with politics, and you know this firsthand teaching government too, do. is you have these politicians that are pandering also to their audiences and audiences that they're looking to reach and try to ga gain their vote, mm -hmm. I guess you could say, um, prior to the election. So um, while some of these positions may not have been what they originally had intended, mm -hmm. um, there is a grain of salt that we need to look at through the political lens and landscape is what are what what are these uh, ideals and, and broader ideologies behind uh -huh. these political candidates? What, what are they willing to budge on and what are they not willing to budge on? Absolutely. Um, and I think for the nation, Leading up to this time period, Lincoln kind of emerged as that uh, that favorite yeah. among many. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that goes once again back to what you talked about a little bit ago when you talked about how the North was far more populous than the South. And so in the electoral system that we have, sure, the popular vote is important, but what it really does is it determines the electoral college mm -hmm. vote. 
And so when you have more people living in the South, you're going to have more electoral, or in the North, you're going to have more electoral college votes in the North, which means that Lincoln will be able to get more votes without actually having to carry any of the states in the South. And he'll still be able to win the election, which is kind of what pisses off the South Mm -hmm. a bit because they don't want Lincoln. They want someone who's going to favor more of of their ideals and their beliefs and one of the big issues is slavery and 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 looking at the context leading up to this you know you've constantly had this growth of the united states and the admission of states into the union there's been this discussion of whether or not certain states when they are admitted to the union are going to be admitted as a slave state or as Mm -hmm. a free state um, so yeah. there's this kind of balancing act that the nation had been playing in terms of trying to keep everybody at bay in terms of the um, the topic hand that is slavery and trying to um, not only satisfy those that um, were trying to maintain it for economic purposes, but yeah. also those that were trying to push back against it based off morality and ethical um, reasons and trying to just get rid of something that they felt was unethical and is unethical so what it leads us to is that in 1860 we have this breakdown where the popular vote um swung in it was lincoln's favor pretty substantial yeah um, where we have the popular vote for lincoln uh at a million point eight and you have uh, john breckenridge that comes in about eight hundred forty eight thousand. so we're looking at roughly a million he shouldn't have gotten much um was he a distant third douglas came in at about 1.38 so i mean he was a distant second uh so he's gonna he's gonna carry the democrats of the north but really what's gonna happen and 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 what we saw here is that he kind of split the party between uh breckenridge lincoln and douglas Mm -hmm. um in terms of um being democrats and then we also have lincoln being a republican um really there was four main nominees Mm -hmm. during this time period that really um spread votes i guess you could say thin but what ends up resulting in is that we have lincoln carrying roughly 39 percent of the vote douglas carrying about 29 percent and then Breckenridge coming in at 18%. So, spoiler alert, what we're saying here is Lincoln wins the election. Lincoln wins that's, the election. That's the spoiler. Exactly. So, yeah. Lincoln becomes our 16th president. Um, and then the South says, ah, oh, hell no, we're not having that. And so, you start to see the split with mm-hmm. America. So, Lincoln's going to take office, mm-hmm. I believe it. March of 1861. I believe that's when they mm-hmm. took office back then. And so... Not long after that, you're going to see the first state secede. So in April of 1861, the first state to secede, um, I think we all know, is South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So they are the first state to secede, and several other southern states secede as well, leading to the creation of the Confederate States of America Mm -hmm. in 1861, and their election of um, Davis, Jefferson Davis, as their president. And so we're looking at now why, why did the South feel that they had to um, leave the Union in order to be the country that they wanted to believe or be? Mm -hmm. Why did they feel like they couldn't be a part of America anymore? Because let's be absolutely honest. That's what they did. They left America. Mm -hmm. They said, bye America. We'll see you later. And, and this has kind of echoes and shades of what we still see today, you know, with um, this there, you might have heard of things like the state of Jefferson, mm-hmm. people calling for um, regions of California and Oregon um, to secede mm. from the state of California to create their own state within the Union. Of I've, never, I've never thought about that now. Mm-hmm. So I've thought this whole time that the state of Jefferson maybe was in reference to Thomas Jefferson, mm-hmm. one of our founding fathers. But what if it's instead Jefferson a Davis? reference to Jefferson Davis, yeah, the be. first president of the Confederacy? I didn't Confederacy. think about that before. I, I never thought of that either. It the same way, but um, that's it would, interesting. It would hold a lot of echoes of what we're talking about here with the Civil War. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you you mentioned two main issues, you know, that uh, or just some main issues <laughs> that um, brought the the Southern states ultimately to seceding from the Union. Um, one, 
namely being slavery, the institution of well, of but let's frame that slavery let's here. frame that the right yeah. way. I mean, so, the way that you're going to sell it to all Southerners, mm-hmm. because most Southerners were not slave owners. That is true. A vast majority, probably, mm-hmm. I think it's somewhere around ninety five percent of Southerners were not slave owners. That's true. So, how are you going to get that ninety five percent to buy into your war? Mm-hmm. Economics. Economics, Mm -hmm. yes. So, and government. We're going to be talking about the government coming in and and taking away Mm -hmm. your way of life. Mm -hmm. The government can come in just freedom, liberty, freedom. Mm -hmm. The government can just come in and tell you what to do, and that is not what America stands for. So, one of the big issues of the eighteen six of the eighteen forties, fifties, sixties, really is. Um, states' rights versus federal rights. Yep. Does the federal government have the right to tell the South they can't own slaves? Does the federal government have that right? And the m- many people throughout the South would argue no at this time. Period. I think, I and think I think many, many people, people around the just world in general today would yeah. still argue that um, same thing. Is that um, we're still kind of struggling with this idea of federalism? We're struggling with this idea of um, having a nation bounded on liberties and principles of democracy and being able to have this kind of social contract Mm -hmm. with the government that saying that you know we give you the power therefore um, you uh, take a bit of our individual liberties but we also expect some of our um, liberties being safeguarded and Mm -hmm. when that doesn't happen um, and namely being in this scenario some of these people throughout the south that felt strongly um, in urging uh, secession from the union urged for this to happen because they felt that the government was no longer upholding that social contract but on the flip side we have this kind of um polarized opinion in the north Mm -hmm. we have this polarized opinion in the north where people are feeling that um we're setting aside maybe some of these um federal principles or or federalism principles, I should say, um, where we're understanding, yes, there's a relationship between states and the federal government, but we are transcending and growing in our development of the nation from where we were uh, roughly 40, 50 years ago with the ratification of the Constitution um, and prior to that with the Declaration of Independence where we set upon a basic set of principles for our nation that all Mm. men were created equal Mm -hmm. um and therefore we need to start upholding that mantra and that brings upon this idea that slavery cannot continue in the union so we have these main issues uh between slavery states rights and i would argue that um there is this uh, and a, a third alternate route um that we should think about in terms of um, is this that bombshell you said you were going to yeah, drop Yeah, this is the me? bombshell. Right. Is that um, in my UCSC days when I was a researcher, um, as Mr. Nunn grabs a bag of chips that we put <laughs> up here because we figured being up here we'd be hungry at some Ooh, point. A little, hungry. Um, a little peckish. Pink Himalayan they're... salt kettle chips. They're delicious. It's two ninety nine at Costco. I'm not wow. sure if they're still in stock. <laughs> Since the last time I we went to Costco, there was not much, um, especially not toilet paper, eggs, milk, or any of the other basic necessities. <laughs> but you can um, get milk and eggs at Juanita's Market over ooh, on Grant Line, so head on over and get it. Um, but... The bombshell that I was going to drop is through my research, uh, one of my main um, misunderstandings was at some point, there's got to be somebody in the nation, it's primarily the South, that feels as if there was something more to them than states' rights. There's something mm-hmm. more than slavery that they cared about because um, the, the common perception is that all Southerners, as we kind of debunked already but all southerners just supported slavery which was just not true and and many of them like you said before were not slave owners however Mm -hmm. i came across one story one time um and it had to do with this gentleman that was a slave owner in the south going into the civil war and felt so strongly to the duty of his country and the, and the liberty and the principles of liberty and democracy and felt that despite his own economic interests and in having the mm. institution of slavery remain, 
Yeah. And even with the secession of um, the South from the Union, he decided to uproot his entire life and left his wife and his kids, as terrible as that sounds, to defect to the Union to ultimately become a spy for the Union on Confederate troops throughout oh, the wow. entirety of the Civil War. So yeah. he was a slave owner that left his entire um, plantation and his way of life with his family mm -hmm. um, to defect to the Union, uh, to basically help the Union win a victory because he felt so strong, a strong sense of duty to his country yeah. that he did not want to go along with those secession principles. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and I think the book is uh, that I got this from was Chickasaw uh, Civil War Scout. Yeah, let's get the. the well, my guess is though is that that's that's not that unusual because when you think about the institution of slavery, and you think about the ideals and the morals of the time, you're still talking about a, a time period that is highly religious mm -hmm. that is highly um highly into like what's proper and mm -hmm. what's not um i feel like a lot of people would have issues with the institution of slavery mm -hmm. and and walking around i mean even today walking around and seeing people who don't look like you wouldn't it be really hard to look at them and be like oh yeah they're not as good as me mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that kind of a hard thing to do? Yeah. Like, you and look into the whites of their eyes, you see that they're a human. How can you not say, oh, that's a human right there? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where many people during this time period was, and, and especially, and still today, especially, but um, during this time period was such division mm -hmm. um, over both politics, society, um, and economics people like this person named Chickasaw, who was, uh, the book's title was Chickasaw, Mississippi Scout for the Union, um, by Levi H. Naren, um, mm -hmm. really understood that there was something more to this war than himself, yeah. more than the South, more than um, his way of life, more than his family, and really was willing to do what he could to fight for those principles, mm -hmm. as you just outlined. Yeah. Uh, so really this identity um of liberty and freedom and democracy transcended this regionality between the north and the south um and whatever other factors you want to throw in there so yeah. um ultimately i think it it's important for us to understand is that there's always going to be some main issues that are driving historical events but yeah. also to understand that there's some underlying stuff that doesn't always get that much um, attention as you might yeah. see in a, in a in a history class or in a textbook mm -hmm. um that also need to be paid attention to as well those different perspectives yeah. absolutely so. um yeah those different perspectives are always important mm -hmm. to look at i mean even even in our current times it's mm -hmm. it's important to look at those different opinions and look at the rationale behind them and and try to see the reasoning behind them as well because there's always reasoning decent reasoning to to the other person's argument mm -hmm. and it's it's important to try to understand that whether you buy into it or not you don't really have to but it's important just to listen and try to understand yep so where does this leave us this i mean spoiler alert North we are winds. still the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. North winds. We are not a Confederate States nope. of the America. We uh -huh. are the United States of America. So the Union does win. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Like you said. Yeah. But so, why? Well, so real quick, the Civil War is 1861. There's a lot of battles between 1861 mm -hmm. and 1865 when the war ends. Um, it's almost four years exactly. It starts in April of 1861 ends in april 1865 mm -hmm. um so basically exactly four years um north winds um there's a couple reasons why really um the north has a few things going for it they're an urban population so there's a lot of cities mm -hmm. um, they have more population than the south yep they have more people which means more manpower which means bigger army more people producing things um, and they're also industrialized. Mm -hmm. So while not the entire <laughs> North is all machinery and production, there's, there's also some farms and things like that, like there are in the South, but there's a whole lot more industrialization in the North than there is in the South. 
Um, and that's really is what's going to win it for the North is in the time of war, they're able to produce things. Mm -hmm. When the South is looking to gain allies with England or France or anyone who's willing to send them some guns or some wool to create some more um, uniforms or whatever, they're mm -hmm. looking for people to send them supplies yep. while the North is able to produce more supplies on their own because it, of that population and industrialization. And it's kind of interesting perspective to put it into today's society is, you know, we have uh, different populations from state to state. We mm -hmm. have different type of economies from state to state. Um, and each state that we have in the union really holds its own, um, I guess value you could say to the rest of the uh, of, of the United States or even the yeah. world. For example, California, according to I was just looking that Business up. Insider, oh my is goodness. the fifth biggest, fifth in the largest world. in the yeah, world, fifth large, yep. largest in the world. So I mean, if you just took California, carved it off the United States map, we would be taking one of the top five economies in the entire world that's probably assuming that the united states is also in there as well because the california united states would still well. be number one it's... china would be number two mm -hmm. but united but california, california by itself as a measure of gdp mm -hmm. is number five in the world exactly. that is better than almost every other country mm -hmm. Um, so that is insane. That's how productive we are. Good job, California. Good job, California. However, this also highlights kind of similarities to the Union in the North yep. during this time period. Is the North had that type of economic and political power in the region. They yep. had the ability and the stability to carry on, whereas the South was much more volatile, much more reliant on um, agriculture, mm -hmm. very much more reliant on trade, whereas the North was able to kind of go along with business as usual. So this idea that industrialization and popularization and also urbanization yeah. creates these uh, main aspects as to why the Union in the North was able to kind of prevail in this kind of long drawn out war. Mm -hmm. um, but really that leaves us with the legacy of the Civil War yeah, and so. understanding where we're at today. So mm -hmm. a question that I want to pose to you, Mr. Nunn, is, you know, what was this cruel four year war fought over? What 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 is the lasting mm. legacy behind these four bloody years where brothers in arms mm -hmm. took up arms against other brothers in arms. Well, and it's interesting that you put it that way. And I think one of the ways that you can kind of visualize it is by watching the wonderful movie Gettysburg. Um, you hear about how these... It's a good movie. It is a fantastic movie, but you also see how these people from the north and the south even though i'm speaking generals mm -hmm. wise even though they were fighting for different size sides they both or they all knew each other yep. they were aware mm -hmm. of who the others were they were mm -hmm. friends many of them had gone to west point together mm -hmm. i mean these people were well acquainted with each other and before the war quite often they would spend time together their families would spend time together this is that kind of war that's how personal it is so it'd be kind of like uh if a hypothetical war broke out between tracy and mountain house or tracy and tracy Lathrop or mantica, or mantica. Yeah. Uh, you would have people that know each other that are fighting against each other because they have different perspectives or ideologies absolutely and things. personally they're very close mm -hmm. um which is why i always always tell my students so children don't ever forget this, that it doesn't matter what your political ideals mm -hmm. are, what your ideology is. Um, you're going to walk in as friends. You need to walk out as friends, yep. too. So mm -hmm. do not ever come into my classroom and let something that we talk about inside of my classroom split you apart. Mm -hmm. It's not that important. You do not want to be fighting a war against someone just because they do not think that Trump is the best in the mm -hmm. world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's not that important people. Um, so let's go back to the legacy. So there's some different kinds of legacies that kind of are still lasting from the civil war. And we saw a lot of this in the last few years. I think, um, the biggest one is you saw this in the news when Southern states 
were pulling down Confederate general statues. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, And people were just up in arms about it because you're pulling down our legacy. These are our ancestors. This is our history. This is where we come from. Well, people, they're pulling down racist people. They're pulling down people who were contributing to keeping slavery as an institution in America. And so the idea and, is and, that... and and they're not trying to erase the memory of the past because that would be even Absolutely. more damaging. Absolutely. Uh, but really we're trying to um really reshape what it is that defines our nation and, and what it is that the legacy that we want to leave behind. Is it the legacy that we want to leave behind these uh these monuments and these statue uh, statues that kind of symbolize um to to individuals or groups or um, other countries even um, false I guess uh, false ideas ideas of what the United States Mm -hmm. is all about or is it that do we want to kind of remain with the status quo and kind of keep this racist ideology going Mm -hmm. that um, has ceased to exist still from this um, civil war and and far past beyond well um sure what i i do have to say that in this world i hope for one of two things i hope to have a statue erected in my honor okay or a school named after me that's my goal in life that's what i want yeah well one or one of the other we might be able to do one of them one of the two would be fantastic now can we just have a statue of your beard would that be acceptable? Like can't not, have, not the face, just the beard. Why would you want the beard without my face? Oh, because then it can, completes the beauty. Yeah, look, because then I mean, look at this. then people could go up to the statue and then be like, "Okay, look, I have Mr. Nunn's beard yeah. on me." Yeah, yeah. So do I measure up? Yeah. Now, I would want a statue erected of me okay. or a building named after me because of the positive contributions that I have made to the community, mm-hmm. okay. not based on bad ideals that I have. I do not want a statue erected in my honor because I um, went out and got into a bunch of fights. Yep. I mean, I do only fight to the death and I've mm-hmm. never lost. That so that's, that's a 50, fact. 54 and 0. 54 and 0. <laughs> so, I mean, I, do, I don't Until want... Until fight. I, <laughs> I will pull your beard at some point. I do not want a statue erected in my honor because of the bad things that I did or mm-hmm. because of the... The, lo- the the bad logic mm-hmm. that I believed in. Um, I do not want people to be like, oh yeah, that's the guy right there who who perpetrated division in society. Mm-hmm. I don't want a statue of me for that reason. And we can and we can instead choose to focus on uplifting individuals that promoted positivity Absolutely. in society rather than negativity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where a lot of that went. Um, yes. And and to go along with that, there's still this long-lasting idea and division between us versus them, where yep. we have um, feelings of some people having their uh, history forgotten and replaced with some that are being championed. Um, this kind of division in general, I think, you know, is not necessarily something that has ever been uh, fixed in the United States. There's always been division. And honestly, Mm. I mean, if you look back to the the founders of our um, federal government, they primarily they're on both sides of the political spectrum. Sure. And honestly, we would not have our um, government the way that we have it. Um, without those different perspectives. But I do want to point out that that came out of a compromise. It's true. Compromise, while has been seen as a dirty word, Mm -hmm. as something that I'm not going to get my way and you're not going to get your way so no one's going to be happy. No, no, no. The longest lasting democracy in the world is our government Mm -hmm. and it is because of compromise. Of compromise. So people compromise it's okay Mm -hmm. some of what you like is great some of what i like is great let's get the great stuff and push aside the crappy stuff Mm -hmm. and work together find the solution not have it kind of create this log jam in society so i mean and and this is something that we struggle with still to this day this is something that Mm -hmm. the united states and uh, following the civil war struggled immediately and for for quite some time in a much more 
a drastic sense in the in the idea that following the civil war you have this period of reconstruction where the the nation's just trying to put themselves back together with uh, yep. and uh, following well let's be honest they're half-assed about it that is true. very half-assed and about they're trying it. to just kind of put band-aids checking a box they're definitely trying to put band-aids on a problem on on a wound yep. that is hemorrhaging where mm -hmm. they should have just sewn it up and 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 move forward yep. but um i think that also leads us to kind of where we're at today in terms of why we're still dealing with a lot of these a lot of problems mm -hmm. that um could have been addressed in reconstruction yep. or prior to then or dating back to a, the foundation of the united states is mm -hmm. that some people argue that the reconstruction this period of time where the nation is coming together following the civil war as the first 10 to 30 years following the civil war yeah some would argue that it's still happening today mm -hmm. and we're still trying to put the piece of, of the puzzle together yeah so um really it, it I, I think it comes back to that idea of compromise mm -hmm. um and when we're talking about compromising i think we should talk about compromising ourselves with um respecting people's time because i think our podcast is it's quickly, kind of long. quickly we're reaching at, about 40 we're minutes 40 minutes now <laughs> uh, so let's kind of let's come to a conclusion let's kind of come here. to the so, end um well one of the things that i do want to bring up though is i do quite often see the confederate flag flying around mm -hmm. yep. um, and it's something that i've seen quite a bit and a lot of people are like oh well it's my it's my ancestry or it's my uh, my history mm -hmm. Well, that Confederate flag, what it stands for is a separation from America. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, I'm going to ditch America if they do not do what I say. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing that, part of the problem that I have with that flag is that it is, it was erected to continue to enslave Americans. Mm -hmm. That's what it was created for. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you boil the Civil War down to what it was, that flag was created as a rallying point for oppression. to keep oppression. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And so when I see people flying it, I'm like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. are, do you have any idea what you're saying? Sure, it's a pretty flag. Sure, you might be saying states' rights over federal rights. But what you're really saying is, I believe in Southern ideals. And one of those ideals I believe in is slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not okay. No. So... Um, I think with that, we'll, when, when we're at the at the end of our content so far for this um, historical portion, um, I think we'll we'll leave it at that, and we'll 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 come back to some of these issues of of symbolism and division sure. and um, and um, other problems that are facing our nation back then and still is facing our nation today mm -hmm. um but i think i want to end maybe this podcast on more of a uh, i guess a Super cheerful positive or, a, note. or a positive yeah, note positive um and let's talk about like what now what now specifically with our society we talked about what we're doing to keep ourselves busy we've all kind of we left school on friday and we're given the Kind of directive um yeah. late shortly thereafter to um to not kind of put out do, not, not do anything not do really anything and kind of self-quarantine and and focus on our health and our health of our family and our community um but really what does that mean moving forward um granted yes we have this um these ideas in place on how we can do some distance learning that the that the district has put out for us sure. so far yep um but uh, ultimately, and I, I kind of, I've told myself and my students this for the past week or two now, is what can we do to hold ourselves accountable? How yep. can we, especially in a time like now, hold ourselves accountable for what we want to gain from our own education? To be honest, me and Mr. Nunn, we're, we're fantastic people. I like to think that <laughs> when we walk through that door... One of us is better than the other. And um, we're you not going to say decide. Uh, But I like to think that when we walk through the door, we try to make our classroom as, as positive as, mm -hmm. uh, as it can yep. be, as safe as it can be, and uh, an awesome learning environment to be in. But yep. let's be honest. We are not the only people that have a stake in the education for mm -hmm. the future of our nation. And to be honest... 99.9% .9 of it has to do with the students yep. and ourselves as individuals mm -hmm. and uh, being 
um, in this position where we're trying to understand how we should move forward and waiting for other people to tell us what to do might give us some clarity about ourselves and what we can tell ourselves to do in this time yeah. period. Um, what, how, how is it that we can help ourselves learn and grow in this time period of uncertainty when we have been told what to do or been telling, yeah. uh, being for the past X amount of years being told how to learn. We can tell ourselves how to learn. We can choose how to learn. We can choose well, what we, to learn. We can choose to learn nothing. I mean, we could couldn't you have been playing learn. Jedi oh. Fallen Order right now? Um, I will not divulge <laughs> how much time I've actually spent in that game over the last week. However, yeah. <laughs> I will say the time that I've spent on the game is uncomparable to the amount of time that I spent doing uh, grading research papers that just True. got turned into me, yeah. um, planning for leadership and student activities next year, trying to understand um, how we can move forward as a school with such a major disruption, trying to understand where, where our portion, um, where my portion of responsibility yeah. moving forward, even past this year, um, <clears throat> can get better and, and yep. can progress even though we're in this kind of period of stoppage. So really trying to understand where we're at academically and, and holding ourselves accountable is gonna be important for us during this time period to keep busy, but also trying to understand how can we come together as a community during this time yep. period. This type of uh, situation with COVID-19 or coronavirus, whatever you wanna call it, um, is not an individual thing. No, It is not something that we as an individual can do, but it's something that we can take part of and fix, yep. start taking part of and fix as our, as individuals and ultimately contributing to the, the, the broader community that we live in to keep ourselves safe and healthy and get us on the right track to, yep. to, to getting back to everyday life. Yep. Yeah. And let's be honest. I mean, the sooner we, we kind of quarantine ourselves, the more we follow what we're being told to do, the quicker we can get back to our normal lives. Mm -hmm. Because the point here is to kind of keep us away from each other so we're not transmitting the mm -hmm. disease. That's what this whole panic thing we're is. We're doing a pretty good job of that right now, aren't we? You and I are not. <laughs> Everyone else is. <laughs> so stay in your homes, dorks. So, um, but let's let's end with something really rad. So what can you do to keep busy? So we'll talk with Mr. Chitwood. Mr. Chitwood, what would you like to do to keep yourself busy during this time? Oh, man, just to keep busy, not having to do with anything with school. I have a backyard that is unfinished. When we mm. first bought the house, there's nut that's just dirt, and my dogs go out there, get all dirty. I would like to be able to look back at this time period and be like, man, you know what? I I learned how to landscape a backyard, <laughs> and that yeah. is going to be a big goal of mine. Is okay. If I have the opportunity to, that that backyard's going to look nice and yeah. pristine. Good. Yeah. So yeah, that's it, very cool. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. What well, about you, Mr. Nunn? Well, I'm continuing to ride my bike around Mountain House. I'm trying to come back not fatter than I was when I left. Mm, that's good so, goal. yeah, riding around Mountain House, I think, will be one of my main things that I do. And I've done that every day since Monday. Um, playing some football with my son. That's the mm -hmm. one sport he likes. He okay. hates every other sport, but just loves football. So playing some football with my son, I think, will be a lot of fun. Um and just listening to a lot of music. Mr. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chitwood, what kind of music would you suggest? What If you were listening to one band right now, who would you listen if to? If I was listening to one band right now? I mean, the, the students know that from the music that I play every single day, I mean, it's it's it can range from, from various artists to various artists. Uh, but largely, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pop po person. I'm oh, also okay. a country person. Yeah. Um, but I think when it comes down to something that I've been hooked on listening to, mm. um, both the Red Hot Chili Peppers and, ah, yes. in addition to that, Streetlight Manifesto mm. has really been grabbing my Solid attention. choices. Solid choices. Mm -hmm. Um, what about I you, have, Mr. Nunn? I have really been in a Red Hot Chili Peppers mood yep. lately. And you and I have talked before about how I don't like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yep. In the last month or They're so, on you? that's become a lie. Yeah, well, I love the Red Hot go. Chili Peppers. So I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, so listen to them. So you're saying maybe try new things. You know, Try to, new things. Trying so, to branch yeah. out of the, the, the style. Absolutely. So yeah, I would say if you're going to listen to some good music, any of the super popular Red Hot Chili Peppers stuff I think mm -hmm. is really good. There's one song that I'm stuck on right now. It's called The Adventures of Raindance Maggie. Fantastic. 
Okay. It's a really good song. I'll have to give it a try. You will definitely have to give it a try. Um, so, The Adventures of Rain Dance Maggie. Good song. Um, but also, I've listened to a new band called Tsunami Bomb. Tsunami Bomb. Yeah, so okay. good. It's punk. I don't know why I said so that good. like Obama. <laughs> so, it's a, like good, to it's a good band. To Tsunami Bomb. <laughs> and uh, it's a good band. Um, <laughs> But anyways, I, I think I think what it, what it comes down to is use this time wisely to to really hold yourself accountable to your own education. Hold yourself accountable to what how you want to grow as an individual, mm -hmm. but also to hold yourself um, accountable and being able to look back at this time period where we're being forced to close our doors and shut ourselves in to, to self quarantine. To look back and say, you know, I really spent that time as best as I could have. I didn't just sit at home, sit on the couch and scroll through TikTok the entire day. I actually spent some time listening to, to this podcast. To listening to this podcast <laughs> and, and growing and helping myself become a better individual by the by the end of it. So um with that, I mean, you guys all know how to get a hold of us. Yeah, um, absolutely. We both have our digital platforms, Edmodo. Use, use Edmodo Remind. I love Edmodo. I don't um, use Remind, but I do Edmodo. You have my Gmail. Mm -hmm. You have my school Same. email. You know how to get a hold of me, so and, get a hold of me. And, and sharing this with your friends that you know might not be on Edmodo or might not um, have the um, direct links to this kind of mm -hmm. stuff might might be useful. And just saying, hey, you know, we're we wanted to put something out to to say, hey, um, we're thinking about we're you. thinking about That's you. That's exactly what this and is. And we're thinking about um, what we love and what we yeah. miss and what mm -hmm. we want to get back to eventually. But also to just proclaim to you that we're just a couple bored teachers with nothing to do. So um, <laughs> yeah. with that, I think we might sign off. And yeah, I'm going to I'm going to end this by saying use this time to become the you you want to be. Mm, that's a good one. We'll see you in a few weeks. All right. Bye. Bye. If you don't care
Broken bone was meant to be When it heals it will be stronger 